Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Henkel, excellence is our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 273 for February 6th. Cadillac Performance, where V is for Velocity. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2300 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Gary Vasilash. Good to see you, John. Oh, I, my I, gosh, I can't believe I'm back here doing the show again. I barely remember you. I know. <laughs> I know. So where were you last week? Uh, I don't know. Where was... Oh, last uh, week. Last okay. week I was uh, with BMW down at the Circuit of the Americas in Austin, Texas, driving their uh, X6M, this, this beast of a of a high performance M vehicle. I mean it's a it's a fairly good sized crossover SUV and uh it's kind of impressive what they did with it. I as an enthusiast, I would not be attracted to such a big vehicle, but what the BMW M guys did with it, as they said, they they're bending the rules of physics mm-hmm. to make that car go fast and handle well. So you're suffering for your art last week is what you're saying. Yeah, I, I did. Somebody had to do it. It may as well be me at Coda driving a high performance car. And we gotta tell everybody we got Greg Gardner with us too. Thanks for having me, John. It's been a while since I've Yeah, with, with the Detroit Free Press. Yes. Doing business reporting and what else? All kinds of auto-related, you know, changes in retailing and, you know, online sales of vehicles and, and mostly General Motors at the moment. There's a lot of news there. But what we should let everybody know is our, our real guest right now is Tony Roma, chief engineer on ATS and CTS. And all the V products? Do I have that right? Yeah. Well, technically it's the CTS and then both of the V products we've got and right Both of the V products. Yep. And we should let everybody know we've got an ATS V here in the studio with mm-hmm. us, and uh, we want to learn a whole lot more about this this okay. ATS V. That, that's why I'm here. We've got a beautiful red one with the uh, carbon accessory package you know, on display. So, and, and we'll get into some of those details in a minute. But okay. what I'm curious is, you know, ATS came out what two years ago? Uh, 2013 model year was the first year. Okay, so, yeah. so then they come to you and they say, Tony, we got to make a V. Yep. What do you really want to accomplish with this car? Um, The goal for this car, different than what we've done in the past, right? We've always kind of had a tweener. We've had one car that we had to bridge, right? So the CTS-V had to be our one luxury performance entry. And we always had to have an eye towards the track nature of the smaller cars and more powerful, luxurious. And so now we get to have this car that is more oriented, still a luxury performance car, but it's clearly more oriented towards somebody who's more track-minded. So we offer the manual and the auto, um, and then this has the larger splitter and spoiler with the better aerodynamics. Um, so that everything we've done with this car was with that in mind, that we wanted something sharper, precise, you know, with a kind of character that you want to push and drive fast. So, so John mentioned he drove an M last week. Mm-hmm. What makes a V a V? Makes a V a V. It's the ultimate expression of a performance luxury driver's car from a Cadillac perspective, right? So we're not trying to make a better BMW than BMW. We're trying to make our interpretation of a modern luxury performance car. And so it's not necessarily a certain power number. There, there aren't like hard and fast rules. It's uh, we shoot more for the character of the car and, and what we want it to be. So. And what do you think the mix will be between manual and automatic on this car? That's a great question. You know, I honestly expect probably more like 80% of them to be automatics. Okay. Still 20% manual. That's yeah. a really high number we'll, for the American market. We'll see if we get there. I mean, certain models of our last generation car, and ironically the wagon was the highest penetrating manual. So those, really? those were the enthusiast, the most the, enthusiastic. The most customers. hardcore. And yeah, exactly. Are there export plans for it? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to export markets. it different places around the world. Um, Europe, um, all over North America, uh, Middle East, stuff like that. So. 
Tony, why did you go with the manual with the ATS, but only automatic with the C? Yeah, lots of debate around that and, and how much development you want to do and how many variants and, and all the rest of that. Um, as you climb up the price ladder and the size ladder, I think the penetration of the manual would get smaller and smaller. And uh, like I said, this is the more track-oriented car, and those are the folks who really value the manual the most. So I think the choice was pretty obvious. So but I, I got quoted somewhere in one of the earlier press things saying that we would consider the manual, and so now I've gotten almost 100 emails from people, please consider the manual in the CTS. So there's certainly a very, uh, we call them the vocal minority that loves their manual CTSs. And, you know, and is this, right? does this manual have rev matching too? Yes, it does which is something I was a little grumpy about in the beginning. I wasn't sure if I'd like it, but when you drive it, it's really pretty cool. Talk about the marketing strategy behind launching the ATS-V shortly before the CTS-V. Yeah, it, it is well, unfortunate in one regard that they come out so close together because we really want to get the story about the ATS-V, and they are two very unique products, right? It's not um, one V launch, it's really two. They're two different markets, and that's going to be our challenge this uh, over the next six or eight months is to tell two separate stories. So, yeah, I, I agree. So we've got a lot of plans to show them at different venues, like we were talking about a little earlier. Um, you know, we're going to take people to Circuit of the Americas, which is a very technical, driver-oriented track. It'll really show off the light, nimble character of the car, how it changes direction real easily. Um, take the CTS to Road America and, you know, let it eat, you know, just open it up and show you, you know, what that car is all about. So, so you got to tell us about what's under the hood of this car, because I think it's pretty fascinating. Uh, a first a first for uh, you guys. The twin turbo V6, I assume mm -hmm. you're talking about. Yeah, this is the LF4 as our internal designation for it. It's a 3.6 liter twin turbo V6. Uh, it's got a, a water-to-air intercooler, so it's got extremely short distance between the turbo and, and the engine to minimize lag. Um, lots of technology in that regard, like uh, titanium aluminide uh, turbine wheels on the turbo to reduce rotating inertia. Um, it's, it's special, you know, 455 horsepower, um, very quick response. It's deceivingly fast when you drive it. It just gains speed. It's one of those things where you look down and you go, whoa. <laughs> you know, it's, it's surprising. So 455 horse out of 3.6 liters, that, right. that's a pretty good number. Yeah, it's, it's uh, at this point in time pretty good for a V6, right? I mean, other people are talking about crazy big numbers. But Can you talk about the use of lightweight materials here to help? For the whole car? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we for instance, the hood is carbon fiber, which, um, you know, you pay a premium for mass when it's higher in the car and certainly when it's further forward. So you want to go as close to 50-50 weight distribution as you can. And I think this one ended up uh, just under 52% from memory. Um, yeah, we use aluminum in a lot of places. There's a shear panel you can't see from here, but underneath the bottom of the car, we had to beef up the structure from the more civilian versions of the ATS. These tires can generate such crazy loads, you know, over 1G lateral on a flat skid pad. Um, certainly a lot more than that when you get on a banked course or whatever. Um, and so. We've paid a lot of premium on materials, right? A lot of aluminum, things like that. So, Let's go back to the engine a minute. Twin turbos. Mm -hmm. Are they different size turbos? One low end, one high end? What, what, no, how do you a, use them? It's twin, two the same size, one on each bank. So one off each of the three cylinders on each side. They're more pretty traditional layout. So they're not staged. They're not asymmetrical or anything like that. And you, you talked about... Uh, the charge cooling system that you have, and I read it some patent pending. What are you yeah, What are you doing unique there? Well, the the patent, and, and I'm not exactly in on the nuances of all that. I'd have to ask our engine guys, but um, it's it's about how we integrated the um, cooler into the intake manifold, and we've got these extremely short runners that feed right to it, and so it minimizes the volume of air that the turbo has to compress. So when you when you uh, you know hit the pedal and, and ask for power, it doesn't have much. Uh, volume that it's got to compress before it hits the cylinder, and that's what it's all about. And so between that and an efficient exhaust path, we've got an integrated exhaust manifold that has one outlet on the side of the cylinder head that feeds right into the turbo, very short lengths. I mean, it's all about every detail, right? And uh, we've got three uh, heat exchangers to get rid of the heat from the boost, so the two right underneath the headlamp there, there's big openings, those feed the charge air cooler to keep... Uh, you know, keep the boost that the that the engine sees nice and cool, so we can make lots of. Power. And, and as long as we got Carmen there with the camera, yep. uh, talk about the 
uh, the carbon add-ons, you got that splitter on the front end. Right, this car, like I said, has our optional carbon package. So the splitter, you can see the exposed weave, and it's what we call book matched on center. So the weave is oriented in the same direction, and it comes to this nice herringbone pattern. It's all about the details, right? But um, you painted the hood. <laughs> We did. We painted the hood. Um, I don't think you'd want the whole hood to be exposed carbon for sure. Mm -hmm. The hood insert, though, you can see there where, where the vent is. That is exposed as well, and it's book matched like the splitter. And then the diffuser in the back uh, matches. So those are the parts. Um, and you also get a taller spoiler to help balance the aerodynamic forces from the larger splitter. You need a little more rear spoiler to balance and, it all. And out. speaking of aerodynamic balance, reading up on the car to prepare for you coming on today, you vent air out of the radiator up over the hood, right. which what I was reading was saying that that would uh, reduce lift. Mm -hmm. But my understanding of aerodynamics is when you accelerate air over a surface, that creates lift. So, so right. how do you reduce lift venting air over the hood and not out under the no, car? No, that's, that's a good question. It, if you think about it pretty simply, you've got to, you get the air in the front and otherwise it would push up on the hood and it has to find its way out from under the car and it pushes up on the car as it sneaks its way out. So by putting a vent in the hood, think of taking like a balloon or, or a, something with a fan blowing under it and just putting a little slice in the top and it would just help vent some of that pressure. Gotcha. And, and even though, yes, it does put a share over the top, um, the two effects we get is more overall flow through the radiator. And you need it with those yep. turbos, And we right? need lots of it, yep. And, uh, and then it reduces front lift. So those okay. are the two benefits okay. we so get. So it's like a relief valve in effect. Yeah. Now, yeah. the car is assembled at your Lansing Grand River plant Correct. with the other ATSs. But talk about the complexity or the differential in the manufacturing process that this requires because of the carbon fiber or because of you know, the design features you just mentioned. Yeah, I mean, the, the, a project like this uh, requires our manufacturing guys to be in from day one, right? Um, we don't make any decisions in a vacuum. Well, we do, we go off and solve the problem, but then we bring them in immediately and say, okay, we've got all these extra parts. Mm -hmm. And so the challenge is to find space, line side. And so the shear panels are quite large. You gotta find room for them. You know, we, we don't paint the hood in our plant like every other car we oh, build, so that requires yeah. special processing to say, okay, you're going to build these bodies without hoods, and then the hood oh, has to okay. come in, and little details like yeah, we had to the, paint. And the paint's got to match, too. And it's got to match. Yeah. Okay. So there are a lot of details it's like that. Is the hood that. painted in, in, by a supplier? Or? Yeah, it's oh. painted by somebody else, and it okay. comes in painted, and we put it on the car, and, and you'll notice if you pop the hood that the hinges are well, the hinges are black mm -hmm. um, because of the, anyway, so there's lots of details, like mm -hmm. you said. Um, most of the challenge is just finding space, like I said, line side. Is, is it an offline assembly for all these bits, or does it just go down the main line? No, like specifically for the hood, we had to find kind of a little chute to put the cars off, but we really don't like to do that, right? That's very expensive and, and kind of tears things up. We kind of lucked out there that we were redoing that portion of the plant anyways, mm -hmm. so we were able to, to sneak that in, but... Um, you know, I'd say 99% of the car goes together like every other ATS. The parts are in some cases just bigger and, you know, the brakes, the wheels, you know, things like that. They just look physically bigger. So, so you mentioned that you concentrated on lightweight materials for this, but mm -hmm. you also had to do the additional bracing to yep. make this vehicle more robust and, and get more torsional stiffness. Right. So if we looked at a ordinary ATS, we looked at this vehicle, mm -hmm. does this one weigh significantly more? Yeah, all of these performance variants weigh more than the lightest of any of their, I mean, they always have. So um, as a rule of thumb, if you can get away with doing a, this kind of performance delta for about a 200 pound penalty, you're doing pretty good. So that's sort of the benchmark you would use. So when we did the first gen CTSV or the second gen or this car, you know, that's kind of the rule of thumb. So. And what are the um, EPA certified uh, miles per gallon numbers? We haven't announced the okay. fuel economy okay. only because we're not done certifying okay. yet. So I, you know, it's one of those things like the crash ratings. I can't tell you something before yeah. we've all agreed on it, blah, blah, blah. One thing I think is cool is uh, Cadillac really kind of pioneered the use of magnetic ride control years ago. Mm -hmm. But I'm so impressed to see you including it on the Vs because typically performance cars like this are great on the track, but man, they'll beat you up for everyday driving. And this has got to be kind of a uh, the best of both worlds, isn't it, having this? Yeah, that's that's our goal, right? So we've kind of coined the phrase um, uh, bimodal 
character for the car, right? So that it's comfortable to drive to work or put your Starbucks in the cup holder and, and cruise into work. And then if you've got the right kind of road or, or on a track day, you know, you click a couple buttons and it, and it really transforms the car. The last gen CTSV, one, the one that just went out of production, used the last generation of the MR hardware. And it was good. And this new stuff, this Gen 3, um, reacts so fast, it's, it's incredible. It changes the way you tune a car. It's so How, how fast. does it change the way you tune it? it? It changes the way you tune a car because we can have, you know, there's almost like five different settings you can have. When you're going down the straightaway, when you hit the brakes to enter the corner, when you're turning into the corner, then when you're mid-corner, if you happen to hit a bump or hit a curb or if you want to adjust your line, and then when you want the car to put power down and, and come out, and then when you want to just be stable at high speed, the shocks are able to react so fast that literally the, the settings between braking and turn-in versus corner exit can be absolutely completely different in a way that a vehicle dynamicist just couldn't even have fathomed 10 years ago. You know, I mean, you, you were you know, making compromises on, well, I want a little more rebound here, I want a little more of this. You don't have to make those compromises anymore. This thing is so fast, the computer and the algorithms can just make it right. Or does that add to the complexity of tuning it? It, it, it does. It, like I said, it changes it because it makes it so that you have to think about these new algorithms that you never even considered were possible before. These things, the way of tuning the car, it's, it's fascinating. We're still learning how to use this stuff. It's so powerful and it changes the way you tune a car. It's really cool. Are you offering any special training for dealers? Because the people that are interested in these cars are very sophisticated mm -hmm. and you know may have, you know, maybe not quite the engineering background you do, but they know what they're looking for. And you know. these customers are very educated, there's no doubt. Um, we do a lot of work with our dealers. We go through, uh, we, we train folks that go out and then train the dealers. And dealers, some of the dealers will send like a key representative and then these folks go out into the field. Um, we do a lot of work with them. So we're just starting that on the V-Series now. We went through that last year with the launch of the CTS where we spent months with the trainers before the launch and then they go out because uh, getting the word out to the public is our challenge these days because these cars are so incredibly complex. I'd like to ask you about this bimodal thing again. So is, is it driver selectable? How, right. How, so, so, so what happens? You so, have one that's like daily driver and then one's track mode? Yeah, so you've got the, what we call tour mode, right? And that's intended to be your you know, cruise to work in the morning mode. So everything from the engine sound enhancer to the steering feel to the transmission, everything about that is kind of tuned to kind of get out of your way and just let you drive. And you're not trying to be engaged in driving is our thought, right? Then you click the car into sport mode and then maybe you're on a back road or maybe you just enjoy a little higher steering efforts. And so it transforms those things about the car and, and the dampers and things like that. Um, then we've got track mode that assumes you're, you want to be more engaged in driving the car. And in track mode, you can engage our performance traction management system. So then there's five levels of you know, wet, uh, sport where the stability control is still on and then we've got two modes where we turn the stability control system completely off and it's only engine torque management for corner exit to maximize your your attractive effort and that's sort of inspired by the the kind of system we use on the Cadillac race car right mm -hmm. so so it's our job to take just all the incredibly complex controls and kind of bake them down into discrete modes that people are going to enjoy. So in track mode, no stability control system? In track mode, in PTM mode four and five, you're on your own. <laughs> you still got ABS, but if you make a mistake you lose on, it, you on lose the corner it. entry, and uh, you know, you're mm -hmm. on your own, right? And in, in sport mode, is it, are throttle settings adjusted? Um, yeah, we do change certain aspects of the throttle progression and, and damping, you know, how, how quickly it'll try and deliver torque or take it away to, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in the different modes, we adjust that. Are you able to take lessons learned from your Cadillac racing program and incorporate it into this? And what have you done? Um, most of the time when we get together with the race team, we had uh, Johnny and Andy out to the proving grounds. Most of the time, they spend time being jealous of some of the technology that we have that <laughs> is outlawed in racing, like our yeah. electronic uh, limited slip differential. They love it. We love it. Um, it's illegal for the race car to use. Um, so they're, they're both great. They read cars very well. They get paid to do that for a living, and they're, um, they're awesome. So. Yeah, we, we do go back and forth with the race you, team. Quite. You mentioned earlier that you don't want to try to build a better BMW M3 than they right. do, and you want to stick 
you know, to your own self-identity as a brand. But what kind of cars did you uh, evaluate as you developed the ATSV? Um, I mean, the obvious list of you know characters, right? So I mean, most of the time we were doing this car, the current M3, M4 that we've now all driven was sort of, uh, you know, industrial espionage type stuff. Everybody was looking at spy photos, so we didn't really know what it was going to be, just mm -hmm. like everybody. So we were driving the V8, you know, last-gen version. Um, and, of course, you know, a lot of our benchmarking was based on the last-gen CTSV, even for this mm -hmm. car. I think the character of the CTSV mm -hmm. was very well received. And so this is just a lighter, more nimble, you know, car like that. Which so. do you prefer driving? Well, hold on. We're going to have to take a break right here. We're going to come back. And in fact, we're getting a lot of questions from the audience. We'll get to those. want to thank Borg Warner for sponsoring that segment of the show. And uh, let's get into some of the questions that we've got here uh, from the audience. Uh, we haven't talked a whole lot about the CTS. We've been talking about uh, the ATS here. Mm -hmm. JM1NB wants to know, with the 200 mile an hour CTSV, is there anything special to do in order to get that top speed? Uh, absolutely. As anybody that, that makes a car that goes that fast will tell you, it doesn't happen by accident by any stretch. So, Well, even, you know, the <clears throat> Dodge... Uh, Help Challenger it. guys told us they could only get to 199. Right. And, and you know, they said, yeah, we could have taken the mirrors off or right. taped up the gaps, but they, they wanted it, you know, from the right. showroom. So it isn't easy. No, it isn't. Even with uh, 640 horsepower, um, a lot of attention to detail with underbody airflow. Cooling is, is surprisingly a big deal, right? Um, you got to make that power for a long time to get up to speed. Um, when you got a supercharged engine, you don't want to let it saturate. So, I mean, incredible simulation that goes into that years in advance and, and just attention to detail along the way to not let your aero numbers slip, to not let, you know, anything. So, yeah. Where do you take it to authenticate, other than simulating? We, we went almost 200 on our circle track, but what we realized Where, was... in Milford? In Milford, mm -hmm. but you're turning at over 0.3 Gs at that <laughs> speed. And if you think about the heat you're generating in the tires, you realize you don't want to do that for very long. Um, so we went down to TRC in Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is the same place that the Chrysler guys went. It's... Mm -hmm. You know. Tony, do you drive them at that speed, or you guys? I, I have. I uh, didn't do our certification run, but I, I have done that. So. And uh, I gotta believe these cars have gone to the Nurburgring, or no? We've been to the Nurburgring uh, twice last year, and we'll go back again, kind of make sure the last tuning run here in a couple months. So. Um, Tim Beaumont wants to know: Will the CTSV get all-wheel drive? <laughs> Uh, the current gen CTSV series and ATS are rear wheel drive. So it's an ongoing debate. I get that question a lot. These are lightweight, luxury rear wheel drive sports sedans, and that's kind of what we're going for. So what all wheel the drive plus, would plus, get What would plus and minus be of, of all wheel drive? Well, mass is the obvious one. It, it changes the character, though. You guys have probably all driven, you know, performance oriented all wheel drive cars, and, and they're different. You know, that's the way I try and explain it to people. It's not better or worse, it's, it's a different animal. I mean, I love the Nissan GTR, but man, it, it's you got to manhandle the thing. It's it's different, um, especially for a car like the ATS-V. We're looking for light, nimble, precise, and those aren't usually characteristics you apply to an all-wheel drive car. Mm -hmm. So that's right. Who Until knows it rains. Future. Yeah. Well, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, uh, we've got a phone call here, Ben. Let's bring that one in. Hey, this is hey, this is Danny Boy in Independence, Ohio. Mr. Cadillac guy, Tony Roma. Uh, Performance figures, please, on the V6 Twin Turbo Cadillac. I've got to know how fast is it? <laughs> Zero to 60, quarter mile, braking, all that stuff. Please. Thank you. Bye. Okay. No, no problem. Thanks. Zero to 60, 3.8 seconds. Now, uh, how do you do that? Are, are you guys doing it like all the enthusiast magazines we do, do yeah. with a 20 mile an hour roll or? Uh, it's a six inch rollout. Oh, six um, inch roll. Okay. Yeah, yeah, which is kind of drag racer standard stuff. Okay. Um, 
So yeah, 3.8 seconds, 0 to 60, 12.2 in the quarter at 115 miles an hour, 189 mile per hour top speed for the ATSV. Um, I don't remember breaking off the top of my head. Sorry, I don't have the, all the specs, but the, those are the numbers, straight line anyways. So, Here's an interesting one. This is, comes from Andrew Charles from Bathurst, Australia. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll edit it down a little bit, but he says that the Cadillac ATS gets better fuel economy than the same size Buick Verano. This is rear drive versus front drive. Okay. Uh, he says, is it time GM, and I think you could say this for any car company, reevaluated the front wheel drive fuel economy myth? I don't really have much to comment on that. Yeah. I don't do much with the Verano. <laughs> I, didn't, no, I don't know what the labels are. I, I'm going to have to go look and see if that's yeah. right, but I, I'll bet he is right there. Could be. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Um, yeah, uh, Gary touched on, or both Gary and Greg touched on this, you know, the use of advanced high strength steel to lower vehicle weight. Can you describe about how advanced materials are used in the ATS? And I got to believe, too, that things like structural adhesives play a big role in how you do that. Yep, absolutely. And, and yeah, it's, it's not just alternative materials like aluminum or magnesium. It's, it's using ultra-high strength steels in strategic areas like the rockers that take a lot of load in a collision and the front rails, B-pillars, things like that. Um, we do things like on the CTS, we scale up the flanges in between the spot welds. I mean, going after uh, every gram, you know, you can, you, you have to pay attention to that because they add up and uh, you don't end up with, well, you know, arguably the lightest cars in their segments uh, by not paying attention to every detail. No, I think what you just pointed out is critically important. Uh, doing those little detail things, you'd end up with a lighter car even if you didn't go to sure. lightweight materials. Right, and that's the key, right, is you know, anybody can just replace something with aluminum, spend more money, that's, that's cheating, and uh, the cars get a lot more expensive. Um, and you do that where it's cost effective, but just efficient design of you know, the stuff that you have to do anyways is also key, right? Load paths, and it, it's the whole, the whole package. Robin Koch says, Tony, there's no way the V-Series could pass muster with the GM bean counters. Do you have corporate patrons within GM, maybe Mark Royce? Mark is a fan. Um, I'll tell you, though, I mean, we, we don't get a pass from uh, being profitable. These cars need to meet certain business objectives. So this isn't a hobby. It's part of our business. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's core to the brand for Cadillac to be relevant. And that's factored into, you know, the whole equation. So presumably you have a little more blanks on your checkbook that you can write out than the guys who are just doing these straight up versions. Uh, no, you'd no? be surprised how small our checkbook is. <laughs> Rob Minton says, ask Tony about the ATS VR version. What's that? The race car? The ATS I guess. VR. He, he says yeah. it will be an FIA GT3 homologated that's car. Exactly He's asking right. that. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. It's an FIA GT3. We, we launched it at an event down at Coda uh, last fall, and then it was at the auto show during the press week, if you guys saw it. It's a beautiful car. Um, it's an even crazier expression of an ATS coupe. Um, with the twin turbo V6, the heart is basically the same. They started with our LF4 and turned the boost up a little bit makes closer to 600 horsepower, so. Huh. Let's see here, this is an interesting one. Uh, George from Sunnyvale says, what are the differences between this engine and the engine in the CTS V Sport, and will it replace that CTS V Sport engine? Um, that's a great question. The V Sport engine is also a fantastic engine. It's a 3.6 liter, 420 horsepower. It uses um, different turbos without some of the, you know, crazy materials I talked about. Um, it runs less boost. I'd say it won't, this won't replace that because this engine is a lot more expensive. Titanium rods, the titanium aluminide wheels, the things you do to get, you know, that kind of specific output at, you know, 455 horsepower versus the price point we're trying to hit with the V-Sport and everything. So I wouldn't expect to see this replace that. Mm -hmm. Right Knight wants to know, what about these rumors of a V8 in the ATS? <laughs> right now they're rumors. <laughs> okay. And he also goes on to ask, uh, what do you feel is the different quality between using, using turbochargers or a supercharger? Um, yeah, I love the supercharged engine. I mean, the CTSV and the LT4 is a beautiful thing. The boost response, just the torque response is, is epic. Um, the twin turbos are the way to get you know, emissions and fuel economy and the whole package. 
certainly the way of the future. So they each have their place. Boy, we could go on and on here, uh, but we're, we're starting to run out of time. Uh, let's see. Uh, we'll do one more. Jonathan One wants to know, what's the weight difference between the twin turbo V6 versus the LT1 V8? Ooh, just for the engines? Uh, yeah, I, I think don't that's know what off he's the top of my head. I, I would bet they're pretty close. Uh -huh. The V6 is probably, even with the turbos and the intercooler, probably a little bit lighter, but mm -hmm. you're probably talking 20 pounds-ish, just off the top of my head. Yeah. So. Hey, this is cool. We could go on and on and on, but Tony Roma, thanks so much for coming on AutoLine After Hours and, and for bringing one of your cars in the studio, too. <laughs> can't wait until you guys get to drive it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I can't wait to drive them. Please invite me. Yeah, will do. <laughs> okay. Real good. We're going to take uh, another quick break here, and we'll be back talking about some other things going on with cars and the car industry. In your life to sell a Challenger? I, I thought, I, I'm with Greg on this one. Uh, I thought it was pretty cool to have people 100 years old yeah. giving these words of wisdom my, to tie my, in. So, the, so, the my, so am I worried about performance or am I worried about mortality? <laughs> but my 26-year-old son <laughs> thought it was pretty cool. Okay, he, he, so, uh, And that's the demographic they want to read. I also thought Chevrolet was creative with you know, their little you know, under-the-radar spot. Um, well, describe it in case well, anybody... Well, the screen went black and there was a sound of static and then all of a sudden they had um, a very simple message about the new Chevrolet, Chevrolet Colorado. It was simple. Um, it was different. Um, it reminded people that, well, if this happened to your television, that it went black, that you could go out in your car and get your laptop or tablet and, you know, use the 4G LTE to watch the game. But... More significantly, it, it, they bought time just before the game, so they paid less. So, Yeah, well, it, it generated a lot of attention because it, mm -hmm. it made a lot of people think something was going wrong with their television when it went all staticky and then black. Yeah. So that, that was clever. I thought that was a way of breaking out of the clutter. Yeah. Of course, you have everybody screaming at it until your ad comes back right. up. Um, I thought Chrysler's overall corporate spot was artistic enough um, and my son recognized the singer as Jim James from My Morning Jacket doing Woody Guthrie's This Land is Your Land. So that was the Jeep Renegade ad, not yeah, the Yeah, but ad. you know, here you use this song which is the anthem of Americana and all of a sudden you start looking at scenes from Europe, China, India, India with a vehicle that's actually going to be assembled in Italy. So, you know... It, well, there, there was a lot, uh, uh, at least uh, in social media, there was a lot of backlash to that on Twitter. Yeah, I especially think they, people were yeah. pulling their hair out. How, how can you but show... They were, but they were talking about it. So uh, Olivier Francois well. pulled it out of... Because, I mean, think about it. Mm -hmm. There was no ad done by... FCA US LLC <laughs> that was an M&M &M ad, that was a Clint Eastwood ad. I mean, it was just basically, you know, we've got these sort of low-keyed, comparatively speaking, how are we going to make people talk about them, okay? Mm -hmm. And so by doing that, and, and you know, you've got to admit, I mean, the, the entire objective of the Renegade, and we, we had it on, on Auto Line Daily when I'd interviewed the people that were involved in the development and in the marketing, uh, um, Jim Morrison and, and those folks, and, uh, you know, they made the, this is a global vehicle. This is a Jeep that we want to sell everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, okay, Jeep, land, this land, you know, I mean, that whole thing. I mean, so they, mm -hmm. they, they tied it together. It wasn't a gratuitous, like, let's rip, you know, Americana off. Let's, mm -hmm. let's rip Woody Guthrie off. You know, maybe next year they'll have Arlo Guthrie. Who knows? Um, mm -hmm. But, I, I mean, I, I think he, he did his job point, on that one. He got people talking about it. Right. And that's half the battle right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. the, the one that I liked that actually made me out, laugh out loud was the, the Lexus RC, mm -hmm. where they had radio-controlled RCs mm -hmm. running around along yeah. with real live RCs. Yeah, that was and it ends with a real live RC doing a four-wheel drift. Mm -hmm. And then here comes this stupid little RC, you know, radio-controlled mm -hmm. car in a four-wheel drift. And, I laugh every time I see that. Yeah, that it's was, just that so good. silly, but it worked for me. Mm -hmm. Just think they were drones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Drone cars. Yeah, that, right. I mean, that's good. At, the, the one that was sort of confusing, and it was, it was funny, I thought, the, the Bryant Gumbel, Katie Couric, BMW yeah. i3 ad. And, you know, because it goes back to 
when when Katie and Bryant yeah, were on the yeah. Today Show together, and they didn't know what the internet was, and they were trying to figure out what the at sign meant for an email address, yeah. and and she, Katie on the set calls off to her friend Allison, who was a right. floor producer or something. You know, can you explain this to us? And then they bring this back for this ad. And the thing that I thought about is is that, okay. Does BMW want to sell i3s to Katie Couric and Brian Gumbel, two clueless people about technology? <laughs> but, but on the other hand, I thought it succeeded as a, a nostalgia play. Um, for an advanced technology vehicle? Because, well, I think a lot of the people who are going to pay for the car, you know, may be older than you think. I mean, um, you know, we'll see what the market tells us. But uh, well, what I thought was ironic about it, and this hit social media too. Katie oh, Couric right. has drives never an driven a BMW in her life and yeah. drives an Audi. Yeah. Right. right, and ironically, Katie Couric now works for Yahoo. She doesn't work for a for a uh, traditional right. media company, so she knows a little bit about the internet now. But I mean, it's just it just seems to me that okay, why does BMW use those those two people? Mm-hmm. I mean, who who were known for being clueless? rather than somebody who would be cool and sophisticated. No, I I think I kind of get it, because here are two people who were clueless 15 years ago or whatever it was, and now everybody accepts the Internet. So now the future is the the BMW boomer. Even baby boomers can evolve, and the fact is they're still buying about two-thirds of the new vehicles on the market. So I I think it probably came closer to hitting the market. Well, I think part of it, too, is... Don't laugh about these electric cars, yeah. because look how we laughed about the Internet yeah. 15 years ago, and now everybody uses it, and that's right. where these mm-hmm. electric cars are going to go, was sort of the subliminal message. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. But their sales were down sharply last month. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. Um, speaking of sales, I mean, obviously, uh, the um, the rising tide continues to rise, Um you know, January was... In the U.S. market, uh, right? Uh, Sales were pretty good. ...strong start of the year. Um, but we are seeing the migration back to, I think, light trucks accounted for 55% of January sales. Yeah, but I, I did this on Daily Today. Go look and see what's counted as a light truck. No, I understand. The Audi All Road. Right. The, the Nissan uh, Road. A lot of crossovers. The, the Chevrolet tracks. I mean, you right. know, so when the public yeah, hears yeah. trucks are selling like crazy, they immediately think of pickups, right. Right. maybe SUVs. Mm-hmm. And they don't realize that all these CUVs, crossovers, That's... which are all passenger car based and by and large are tricks of the car companies to try and boost yep. their truck fleet and not hit their path. So they classify them as trucks. And uh, so your, your point's. Well taken, but, Greg. It, yeah. Trucks are going well, but it's not as big as I think a lot of Maybe people the more see. telling statistic is the average transaction price went just short of $34,000. Correct. Now that reflects, you know, was the yeah. fact that pickup trucks. I thought 33.9. Yeah, pickup trucks have become, for the most part, a, a luxury vehicle. And the luxury market itself, whether it's a car, a crossover, whatever, is very strong. And I keep pointing out, and you just wait a few more years, prices are going to go up even more because all this fuel efficiency technology does not come free. You know, if you want to go aluminum and carbon yeah. fiber and, uh, you know, electrified powertrain and all, it adds cost. So here's, since we're talking about trucks and sales and things like that and statistics, here's an interesting thing. So I I was looking at the the sales of GMC, right? Mm -hmm. So basically General Motors truck brand, right? Fair point? Mm -hmm. Fair point. Okay. So their sales for January were 35,671. Okay. So just remember 35.6. So I thought, hmm, let's look at what, what Buick's total was. Cars and some light vehicles, right? Twelve thousand five hundred and fifty-three. Or Cadillac's mm-hmm. total sales. Eleven five. Eleven six eighty. So you add those two together, and you get twenty-four thousand two hundred and thirty-three. Mm-hmm. Now, okay, I thought, wait, this is not fair, because mm-hmm. GMC has a Sierra, which is the mm-hmm. light truck with big sales, right? So I took the Sierra sales out. So they sold 12,621 Sierras. 
So that leaves you with 23,050 vehicles sold by GMC. Mm -hmm. So you have the combined Cadillac mm -hmm. and Buick at 24,233 and GMC minus Sierra at 23,050. It's a 5% difference. They're just 5% below. So mm -hmm. this whole thing of, of light vehicles that aren't pickup trucks, I mean, because you got to count, they, they've got some Canyon numbers in there. I mean, but the mm -hmm. Canyon numbers are still pretty small, but yeah. it just shows what, you know, your point is, is that, is that people are taking these other types of vehicles and, and wrapping that in there. And you're just seeing that uh, the power of that. So I think what we're seeing is that there's a shift away from the whole sedan market that yes. people are becoming, yes. you know, decreasingly interested in traditional sedans, but they're interested in those traditional sedans if you get, get them built with a high H point. High, well, you know, what we're seeing is a move away from the traditional three box design, that is the hood, the passenger compartment in the trunk, and going to a two box design. Mm -hmm. And for a whole host of reasons, that's what the public likes. And guess what? This is a global phenomena, whether you go to Europe or China, or I don't care where, the crossover silhouette is the booming part of the market. Mm -hmm. which, which really makes it troublesome for the guys who are designing cars, I think. I mean, going forward, I mean, uh, what's going to be looking like for them? It's, it's a real problem. It's, uh, it is. But that's always a, a great challenge to have. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, look, uh, let's take another quick break here and, uh, and pay some bills. And there's plenty more to talk about when we come back. Uh, I want to talk about that Nissan LMP1 race car. I'm blown away by that thing. A little chemistry goes a long way, especially when it comes to vehicle development. From enabling the use of alternate materials to withstanding extreme vehicle environments, Henkel's adhesive, sealants, and surface technologies provide solutions for every vehicle segment. Come see for yourself. Our Detroit area headquarters offers 12 research and development and testing laboratories with the ability to do full range testing and validation on actual vehicle parts. Sign up to tour our labs at henkelna.com forward slash tour. Yeah, I want to thank Henkel for supporting the show, too. It's, it's great to have... Uh, and, and Henkel had a Super Bowl ad, Loctite. That's, that's, was that local, though? No, it's, I, no, I think that was a national ad. Yeah. Really? A yeah. national ad? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Impressive. Mm -hmm. yeah, that no, was a funny ad. Yeah. So let's talk about this Nissan LMP1 race car. I don't know if you guys have looked into this thing or much or not. But I read the thing. Uh, I am knocked out. And, and this is Ben Bowlby who longtime Autoline After Hour viewers will know about because we talked so much about his last radical breakthrough design with the, the Delta okay. Wing, also uh, really sponsored by, mm -hmm. by Nissan. And people may have caught that in the Nissan Super Bowl ad, one of the Nissan Super Bowl ads, the one with the uh, cats in the cradle as I the- I hated uh, that ad. I thought that ad was so stupid, but I love seeing that race car in yeah. there. And they also uh, showed the, the new Maxima. Yeah, yeah, teased that. But yeah, I'd, uh, but yeah, the the, the new the new uh, LMP car that is is really has an unusual design. I mean, doesn't it like the when I first saw it, I went, boy, that's kind of cab rearward funky. sort of thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. it didn't look good. And, and then as I read that article in Racer Racer.com, Magazine, yeah. which was really good, it was like, oh, oh, that's why this is looking like this, and that's why that's so. There. So explain why it has yeah, such a long well, front well, end. First of all, you know, let, let's take another step back. In the LMP category, the rules allow you to do a lot. So the so engineer prototype, prototype loved class. this. It's a prototype class. So you can do stuff. You know, everyone talks about F1. F1's the pinnacle and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, but it's very restrained what you can get away with. And uh, mm -hmm. in any case, uh, with this Le Mans effort, and make no mistake about it, this is a Le Mans effort. This is not for the whole you know, racing series. They're going after Le Mans. So with this freedom, design freedom, Ben Bowlby, who is extraordinarily creative, figured out that he could get a lot of aerodynamic uh, benefits if they made this a front engine car. Mm -hmm. And they run two tunnels inside the car from front to rear, which has the effect of reducing, I'm guessing, mm -hmm. the frontal area. 
you know, because the real way that you calculate the uh, the drag of a car, aerodynamic uh, rating of a car, is you, you put it in a wind tunnel and you measure the drag. But so you look at, you take the drag number and you multiply it by the frontal areas. Mm -hmm. In fact, sometimes you'll see that uh, aerodynamic rating not as CD but CDX, mm -hmm. meaning they've taken the drag and multiplied it by the the frontal area. So anyway, going back to uh, the the Nissan car, they run two tunnels from the very front, from the grill of the car all the way to the rear, and all it does is it let air run right through the car, which has the effect of not having to push of much mass of air mm -hmm. above, around, or underneath it. And I've never, mm. uh, now I, I don't remember this, but apparently Toyota had tried something similar on one of their race cars. Although I should I, I say Toyota, it's really Dan Gurney's All-American mm -hmm. Eagles out in California, which, by the way, built the Delta Wing, and which, by the way, has also done this new Nissan car. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the powertrain setup of, of this is also interesting. It's, it's so weird. So uh, anybody who wants to learn more about this should go to the AutoLine website and do a search for Flybrid, like F-L-Y-B-R-I-D. It's, it's not a hybrid, it's a flybrid. And these guys at Track, a British company, came up with the idea of storing energy in a flywheel. They're not the first to do it. The, the, this idea goes way, way, way back. You might remember as a, as a kid when you had a little model car and you'd run it on the rug, zing, 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 get the, the flywheel inside spinning and then you'd let it go and it would mm -hmm. scoot across the, the floor. Well, this does the same thing, but it stores a lot more energy. Mm. And uh, they the flywheels got, in the rear. The flywheels in the front. Oh, okay. And to get power okay. to the transmission, they run a drive shaft through the V of the V6 engine sitting up front to oh, get wow. to the transmission. And what I love about this, and I've said this all along, is. You know, everyone's gone chasing hybrid batteries, nickel metal hydride to begin with. Now yep. they're into, you know, uh, lithium ion and who knows what comes next. Mm -hmm. This stores energy in a flywheel. So there's huge packaging and potentially massive cost savings doing it this way. Mm -hmm. Now, in a race car, you don't care about the cost savings, but this can put out so much power. And I, I, I'm not an engineer. I don't understand half this stuff, but... In the Audi Le Mans car, their kinetic energy recovery system can put out two megajoules of energy. What they're trying to achieve in this new Nissan is eight megajoules, mm -hmm. four times the energy. Mm -hmm. So this could be not only a breakthrough in motor racing, there are also implications of doing hybrid cars at far less cost uh, using uh, this, uh, this uh, flywheel. Although uh, uh, back in the day, back in the days of U.S. car development, mm -hmm. when they were doing that, and there was there was a lot of looking into using flywheels for well, well help for me understand storage. how it reduces the need for the uh, how it you need less of a battery pack with a flywheel. Is that the, well, you know, you don't it? have a battery at oh. all. So oh, okay. when you, when spun up. Okay. when you're driving okay. along okay. and you hit the brakes yeah. in a typical hybrid today like a Prius, yeah. it runs a generator sure. that puts electricity into the battery. Right. So a lot of your braking power is accelerating this generator mm -hmm. to generate electricity. Mm -hmm. Okay, with the flywheel or the flybrid, you spin up a flywheel. Okay. And now you can do two things. You can use it to generate electricity, huh? or you can mechanically harness it into with drive, gears, into the drive feed drive. that power into the transmission, and get okay. a big boost in power. So anyways, I was saying the, the problem that they saw was, okay, you've got this thing rotating at huge velocities. Mm -hmm. If it explodes... You're in deep trouble. And that was always the problem because they, they figured that in order to have it safe enough for mm -hmm. consumers to be driving around, you'd have to have such a, a thick case that you'd add so much mass to the vehicle that effectively you'd be, you know, losing the energy benefit because you're carrying the, the extra mass. I mean, the same way the battery, you know, the problem with batteries is they're just too damn heavy, but they're pretty benign. But if you have this thing going at, you know, 
hundreds of thousands of RPMs. Is well, remember shrapnel. back in the mid 90s, Chrysler started a program to go race at Le Mans with a flywheel, which in testing, not out on a track, but in a dynamometer, did let go and killed one of their guys. And that kind of put the whole kibosh on that program. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. When these things go, man, they, they blow it up real good. Yeah, real good. <laughs> so uh, I know uh, if you go to our website and search, back in 2008, we had a guy from Toro Track come out here to Autoline and then pitch us on the whole idea. And they, they were packing this stuff in a vacuum so the flywheel doesn't encounter any resistance. resistance inside. And they were using ceramic and air bearings so that it had almost like no friction inside. Clearly, they must have overcome this issue of the thing blowing up, or mm -hmm. you would think that they have, because otherwise I can't see why they would be pursuing it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, so, so, I, I, I can't wait to see this so, car so race. Speaking of Chrysler, I, I, just, I saw something that was, that was sort of surprising today. Yeah. A, a blog item. Did you see that? Yeah, I did. And, well, and um, so, well, go ahead. Um, Gilberto Ranieri, who is the VP of Corporate Communications right. for FCA US LLC, headlined The Truth Behind the Chrysler Bailout. The first line Time has come to once and for all put to bed the urban legend that, quote, Fiat SPA's Sergio Marchionne gained control of Chrysler without spending a single dollar, close quote. And then he goes on to explain that. It's like, what, well, what happened? My question was, yeah, what is, was this in response to? And I'm not sure. I, I haven't gone. Now, it might have been something that Jeb Bush said at the Econ Club. Oh, really? Um, I don't know that. But uh, it's certainly nothing that I saw reported. I mean, although it's, I mean, it's a subject of endless debate because okay i mean the bottom line is no one else was interested okay no one in the world okay that and he that's points true. that out at the time yeah. nobody was lining up at but price resolver until go, Michigan headquarters but, interested in buying but, a single stake in the automaker but, but if you go back to steve ratner's book um where they were negotiating with sergio i mean at one point before they closed the deal he came ratner came to marchioni and said listen you know, it would really help for optics if you put up some token amount. And Sergio said, no way. OK, so, you know, the, it's a little bit, you know, the, the mood, the point somewhat moot, because here we are five, almost six years later, and things have worked out better than most expected. So, you know, what's why are, what's the point in being defensive now? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I don't know why. They, they've got a pretty good story to tell. Yeah. And, you know, it kind of harkens back to when Nissan was floundering. Yeah. And Bob Lutz said, hey, you know, don't go buy it. You know, take right. the equivalent of gold, sail it out into the ocean and throw it overboard. You'll get right. the same result. Yeah. But Carlos Ghosn stepped in, Nissan, right, or right. Renault. Actually, it wasn't even going. It was his predecessor. What was mm -hmm. the guy's name? Louis Schweitzer? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But Schweitzer was the guy who said, who saw the value and sent going. He mm -hmm. sent mm -hmm. going to say, go straighten that mess out, and the rest mm -hmm. is history. Mm -hmm. But according to this, Fiat SPA paid more than $5.6 billion to acquire the full ownership of Chrysler Group LLC. So he's saying these. Five, five point six billion. Well, that I think reflects the repayment of the loans, okay, or mm -hmm. the re repayment of, yeah, of the loans. I believe, well, yeah. It costs money. I mean, when they yeah. got Chrysler, it was flat well, broke. Sure. I mean, Cerberus it, and Daimler before them had taken care of all of Chrysler's yeah, cash. Yeah, yeah, no one. Yeah, no one's denying that they, the Fiat saved the company. Um, you know, it's, it, yeah. Well, but he breaks it down. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah, not like yeah, he's not, yeah, he's pulling yeah, the number out of the air. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and he has, yeah. he has it. But, I mean, it's just like so odd to see this. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Well, like, you might be onto to something there, Greg. Did, yeah. did Jeb Bush say something that they went, whoa, 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 yeah, whoa, we got to yeah, stop this out now? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's almost, it's almost reached the level of refighting the Civil War. I mean, you know, here we are <laughs> in much better shape, especially here in Detroit, than we were six years ago. Um, you know, we can debate, debate the bailout forever, but, you know, we're back on our feet. 
you right, know. but when you're refighting the Civil War, it's because there are guys who are wearing blue uniforms and guys yeah. wearing gray uniforms, yeah. and I don't know who's wearing uniforms in, in this war anymore r at all. R right. Yeah. So it's like, And you know what? Th look, this is just another chapter. Yeah. I'm positive there's more consolidation to come. Oh, you boy. Know, and yeah. everyone's speculating. So who do you think? Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, when I look at Fiat Chrysler right now, uh, Fiat's got a strong presence in Europe and Latin America. Chrysler, strong presence in North America. Neither one of them are anywhere else to speak of. Well, they're just getting started in China, just which is really in China. So, wouldn't it make sense to go partner with a Chinese company, not one of the state-owned ones, one of the private ones? You know, so a, a cherry, a Great Wall, a uh, uh, well, Chang'an, uh, somebody like that. That I mean. So, the and then there's talk of could build our dreams. People. What about you know Volkswagen well, yeah, stepping into there, it? There, I mean that has a lot of plausibility because Volks, you got Chrysler Volkswagen. Yeah, because I mean when we look at the uh, tally of who sold the most vehicles globally every year. I'm not sure GM or Toyota care all that much about it, but Volkswagen does. And if they're second or third, and they have set this very ambitious target in the U.S. and North America that right now they're not going to hit. They're not going to hit their target. Lease. Leases. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's, I, I think that's one of Volkswagen's big problems. Mm-hmm is their leases. They're, they're just not competitive. Mm -hmm. But why are they not competitive? Because their residual values suck. And the residuals values suck. Why? Because people perceive that their quality is no good. Well, so. and plus, the, they're not in the traditional pickup. And I mean, they have crossovers, but right. you know, they're not. They're, they're, they're not, not where they need to be. Which, right. which is essential in the, in the U.S. Yeah. I, I would be surprised if we saw a Fiat Chrysler Volkswagen tie-up. I don't think it'll happen. I think that maybe VW would like to buy Ferrari, and that may... Well, Alpha, they've already said that, but that's not going to happen either. Well, if you don't know, they yeah. could, could hew off uh, some of these I, things yeah, to uh, get I, money to do something else, but... Uh, well, you know, I, I would look, uh, when I look around the world and I see Subaru, I mean, here's a company that doesn't even sell a million cars worldwide at a time where everyone else is saying you got to have six million or you don't have. But no, no, they've outsold. Fuji, Fuji heavy industry, so let's not forget that I, well, they're. Yeah, uh, no, that's they have, true. They, that's they, true. They have I look resources. at Mazda, which is a terrific little company. Mm -hmm. I think they do about a million five units of their own because yeah. they they market Su some other. Subaru stuff. has grown under the radar, and I mean they basically taken. Volvo's lunch, but they're eating into Volkswagen and, and others, yeah. and, you know, uh, and they're still putting up over 20 percent year over year sales in the United States, in the U.S. Full yeah. stop. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The, 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 the Subaru in, in, in miracle the, in, is in an the, American And the phenomenon. question becomes when when Subaru stops being sort of the the quirky underdog little brand, whether or not people just sort of look at them and say, you know what? They're just like everybody else. Now they have different technology, grant them that. But there still is something of a cult nature to that vehicle. And if mm -hmm. they keep expanding, and it was another month of record sales for those guys, and you look at what they sold you know, last January compared to this January, you go, oh my God, I mean, it's just like, well, are they printing money over there? Impressive. And, but again, I mean, so suddenly when you see them everywhere, does everyone still want them? Yeah, no, great question. And you know, going back to Volkswagen a minute, you know, it owns a little chunk of Suzuki, and Suzuki's kicking and screaming all the way. They want out. They don't want to be part of VW, and VW is not relinquishing, mm -hmm. you know, that control. But, you know, again, coming back to what kicked this all off is I, you know, we're, we're, you know here's FCA going, wait, 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 we spend money on this, and people are like, you know, was this the right thing to do? There is more to come. This... This industry has always been in turmoil and always will be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and that's just on the OEM side. Man, we talk about suppliers. That's where the real action is going to be. And look what's going on on the retail side with people like Warren Buffett starting to buy into, you know, they bought the Van Tile Group, mm -hmm. the, the largest private dealership group in the U.S. Now supposedly George Soros is monkeying or, you know, looking around where he can buy in and, 
that's going to, I believe, set off a stampede of other investors going, whoa, if those guys are in there, whoa, we better get in too. So I, I think this automotive business 10 years from now is going to be very different. All right. So, so does the consumer benefit out of all of this? I think so. You know, if you, you look at today's cars, uh, they're the safest they've ever been. They're the most efficient they've ever been. They've been they're the, the most comfortable they've ever been. And look at the performance. Well, I agree for vehicles that are less than five or six years old. But as the recall crisis of last year showed us, the gap between the quality of relatively new vehicles and those that have been on the road for 10, 12, 15 years or longer is an issue. Um, and um, I, I'm, I, I'm not disagreeing, Greg, mm -hmm. but I would add this caveat. Mm -hmm. It's not as if quality all of a sudden got really bad in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. It's that there is a climate in Washington, D.C. right now that you better goddamn well issue a recall the minute, the nanosecond, you think there's any kind of an issue. Even if you don't know the answer or really what's going on, you better issue a recall right now because if not, you're going to be accused of a cover-up. And so we are seeing everybody announce everything. And I'm, I'll, I guarantee you that the, the cars that are getting recalled right now in record numbers are built better than they were 10 years ago. Preemptive recalls. Sort of, well, sort of oxymoronic. No, uh, no call it before we no, need to. They're, 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 that's a fact. There are preemptive recalls. But again, I get back to the, the Takata you know, crisis. This is something that most of the manufacturers have known about for a long time. Okay, And OK, maybe we didn't have and we still only have a handful of fatalities, but that's 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 major serious problem. Enough. Yeah. But but problem, you know, th whether it was overly aggressive deployment or de deploying when there was no collision or I mean, <laughs> um, you know, Honda kept resourcing Takata for their airbags, you know, long after they knew there were issues. I know. But but and we, we've talked about this on the show before. Mm -hmm. and I don't want to get too much into it because we're, we're down to the very end. But sure. I mean, uh, these Takata failures are extraordinarily rare, extraordinarily rare, and nobody has identified the root cause of the problem. In fact, we've seen 10 car companies at a meeting here in Detroit, everyone got together, all their experts, to try and find out what is going wrong. We've never seen that in the history of the industry, where 10 automakers would join together to solve a problem in the field. And so the best minds in the world cannot find out what the root cause of this is. But we're still demanding that they recall these cars and fix them. How do you fix something that you don't know if even the replacement part is any good because you don't know what the root cause of it is? And like I said, uh, now this is Takata data, mm -hmm. the failure rate for deployed airbags is point zero 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 six, And I have to count it on my fingers, but it goes out six decimal points. I, I think we may never find what the root cause of this problem is. We is that the end of the show? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we end on a question yeah, mark. Yeah, we end on a question mark. But uh, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's a great topic. It's not going to go away anytime soon. I don't know what the industry does on this. But my feeling is we're seeing record amounts of recalls, not because there's more problems than there ever has been. Mm -hmm. There's car companies who have got the stuff and scared out of them mm -hmm. that they're going to be hauled into court over, not announcing a recall the first time they find any kind of a problem. And this also speaks to the issue that we don't want too much supplier consolidation because if one supplier is doing something that is questionable there's someone else or ideally well, someone's else oh, but I think there step in. again just to focus on airbags I think there will be a consolidation I mean I think Takata basically gets absorbed by TRW or auto leave or whoever right um, to, as part of the solution um, again I'm not an engineer but I, I think there's do airbags need to be replaced like every seven or eight years 
Well, I, I want to say that uh, safety systems by law have to be good for 10 years or 150,000 miles. See that? And the average car today is 11 and a half yeah. years. So I believe you're on to something. But, but, but what puzzles me is the average age is still about, it's been there, maybe it's come down you know, a Maybe. fraction of a year in the last four or five, at a time when sales of new vehicles are going back to, you know, record levels. Now, uh, that tells me there are a lot of people that are just still going to hang on to, to what they've got um, and, and bear the risks. Yep. Well, hey, with that, why don't we wrap this up? All right. Okay. Greg, great having you here. Yeah. Very interesting. And it was great great having to Tony here. Roma, too. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. So, Gary, let's do it again next week. <laughs> so we'll both be here. Yep, we'll both be here. All right, okay. good. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Okay. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. And by Henkel, excellence is our passion. Starting March 5th, AutoLine After Hours moves its live broadcast time to 3 p.m. Eastern time and every Thursday. Again, that's March 5th at 3 p.m. Detroit time for AutoLine After Hours. Visit our website, AutoLine.tv, where you can watch us live. Get your daily news fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.